everyone. I hope you guys all had a good weekend and have a productive week so far. Uh, certainly appreciate your questions. Uh, there's some robust discussion that goes on around those questions, and we want to make sure that we continue to have these calls uh, where we're working together through uh, model of transparency and a better understanding of actually what impacts you as uh, providers and partners and, and things that the department does that we're aware of and things that we're not aware of that impact you. So a lot of good questions came in last week. As Kara said, it was a little bit of a unique uh, circumstance last week on Friday. So thank you for those of you that were able to make uh, adjustments to your schedule to be uh, to be on the call uh, with us. And uh, certainly looking forward to some continued discussions this morning with the questions. So with that, I will turn it back over to Kara. Thank you. All right, the first thing that we really want to talk about today is something that is a very discouraging and troubling trend for us, which is the increase we've seen over the past couple of weeks, uh, not only in uh, uh, the increases of people uh, supported who are testing positive, but also a very large increase in the number of staff who are testing positive. And obviously, there are oftentimes some correlating uh, folks supported uh, as well. So to address that, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Turner and also Dr. Davis to kind of talk about what we're seeing and also some of the things uh, that uh, we're thinking about as moving forward, because a lot of people have had questions about staff testing and those kinds of things. So we want to, um, we want to spend some time talking about this today. Uh, Commissioner and Dr. Davis. Yeah, thank you again, Kara. And, and as Kara alluded to there, we're, we're seeing a very troubling uptick in positive cases from uh, not only person supported, but probably just as importantly uh, as staff and uh, staff and provider homes and, and areas of responsibility that are critical uh, for what we're trying to do. And so uh, as we're navigating some of this, what we want to make sure we do is stay in front of that. And so we are asking that you continue to work with us uh, to hold uh, yourselves accountable, to hold us accountable on what uh, that looks like as it relates to uh, positive tests that we're seeing in an uptick in both person supported and staff, uh, but things that we might be able to do collectively, but even individually uh, to figure out ways to try to mitigate this jump that we've seen um, in the positive tests ac across the board. Obviously, this is not just a, a statewide or even a local issue. This is a national issue that's happening right now. Um, but we want to be good partners with you to try to figure out how do we get to the source uh, of what's creating such an uptick in all of this. And it's not something, you know, that I can do on my own or that you can do uh, on your own. Uh, it's something that we all have to do uh, together. And so, you know, as we work through that, I want to make sure that we attack this with the same type of vigor that we do every day in our jobs and protecting persons supported. Uh, so, you know, all of us at this point, we're all the regulators and it's time to mount up. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Davis and allow him to share some of the statistics and some of the areas of concern that he's seen from a clinical perspective uh, with the data that he receives every day. Dr. Davis. So uh, here's here's a sobering statistic uh, within the past, uh, within the first three and a half months of this, beginning on March 13th we had 72 cases of cases of COVID-19 for persons supported. In the last two weeks, we've had 35 additional cases identified. Within the first three and a half months of this COVID situation, we had 116 staff members that had been identified. Since uh, that uh, two weeks ago, June 30th, we have had 83 additional cases identified among our staff. That uh, for the person supported is a 49% increase for staff. It's a 72% increase in COVID-19 uh, positive cases. So we're, uh, it's ramping up. And, you know, part of this may be attributed to increased availability of testing, no question about it. But all the testing is doing is identifying cases that were out there that we didn't know about. So uh, we have a, a, a difficult situation on our hands. As I've said repeatedly, we're gonna have this situation for a while and we're gonna have to develop procedures to be able to carry on our lives with it and also to continue to do things to protect ourselves. One of the uh, things I brought up a few months ago and there was an article that I wrote that I'll, uh, I'll redistribute to people if we need to, but uh, about 
how to deal with this with your staff and really to try to educate your staff about the risks associated with uh, COVID-19. Educating people, I think we, we may have had, uh, you know, kind of collectively some different information initially about masks and, you know, whether they were effective or whether they weren't. Let's let's get down to the brass tacks. Masks are effective. They help. Uh, they're a layer of protection. And so really we need to be encouraging people when they're at work to be wearing masks and also when they're not at work to be wearing masks when they're in a public setting. Anytime that they may, may come within six feet of someone else is a time that everyone in this society needs to be wearing a mask. Uh, and why is this so important? We've had six deaths within our department, six people who have died who would not have otherwise died had they not gotten COVID-19. And that rate of death is higher than it is for the total U.S. population, and it's four times as high as it is for the, the, uh, uh, for the Tennessee population. So there is a a great need for us to be very diligent about this. And it's it's certainly not the time to relax. All of the guidance you've been given about these, I mean, these things need to be reinforced over and over. And to the extent that you're not doing this currently, you need to go into people's homes and observe or observe it remotely or however you can do it safely, but to ensure that people are carrying these recommendations out and they're, they're doing the things that they can to protect one another. None of these things by themselves are enough. Washing your hands, not enough by itself. Uh, wearing a mask, not enough by itself. Staying six foot distant from other people, not enough by itself. And all of these things, uh, even if you do all of them, there is no guarantee that you would not contract COVID-19 for some reason. But the Ultimately, if you can add these layers of protection on, then you're safer. And you really have to educate your staff on this, show them the statistics, tell them about the things that we've talked about uh, that indicate the need to do these things to really keep our population, uh, go ab above and beyond what we do for ourselves or the typical person to, uh, to protect them. Uh, it's just important, critical at this time. Carol? Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for uh, that. And I think that uh, Dr. Queen's question got answered um, in, during that. So, um, so obviously, we did really want to spend some time talking to you all about that. Um, the chat box is open, but one of the things we're going to do now is uh, talk, hit some of the points that we weren't able to hit on Friday. And the first one we were going to add, uh, um, address was we got a question about the um, in the concept paper it talked about the HMO premium tax of 34.4 million state dollars. Uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Andy Kidd is going to discuss um, uh, that with you all. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, everybody. Um, that's correct. Tennessee currently has an HMO premium assessment of approximately six percent. Um, so moving the ICF and ID, IID services and the 1915C waiver services into the managed care program um, means that it will generate approximately $34 million in additional state dollars. Um, and then we also have a federal match of about 65.8% that can be helped to, to pay for those services, um, which all this means is that we're able to use the additional funds for direct care for the people that we support in a more flexible manner. Um, and that provides us with much more efficient and effective use of state and federal Medicaid resources um, to help serve our population. So it's very crucial that uh, we perform this and we were able to use those dollars in, in a more efficient way. Thanks, Kara. Um, another question we got, we, we talked about the uh, staff testing. Oh, we did get a question about um, the best process for uh, requesting and receiving funding for COVID-19 positive cases. I think uh, that Jordan, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Allen, was going to discuss that. Jordan, you might be on mute.
Indeed, I was. Thanks, Kara. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, funding for for COVID-19 positive cases, as communicated uh, when we submitted Appendix K originally, included a couple of different funding approaches. The first of which was a 10% across the board uh, rate increase for a period of two months uh, to help get cash flow back into the network and offset some of the costs agencies experience. Uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic really begun, began to hit Tennessee. The second was a more uh, hazard pay approach. They were residential uh, and personal care adjustments. And those were specifically designated for persons uh, who were COVID positive and to help agencies pay uh, a differential rate of pay for staff that would be directly supporting people who were COVID positive to offset some of the cost of personal protective equipment and other administrative costs associated with that. The funding for that hazard pay or those residential and personal care adjustments uh, continues to this day and will continue until we expire the available funding. There were $500,000 set aside. Um, we have not reached that threshold yet. And so as positive cases come in and agencies are meeting the criteria for payment, and again, that criteria is spelled out directly on a document now linked on our website, but also distributed uh, through the open line and regional blast system. Uh, as long as agencies are qualifying for the payment, then they notify the department. Uh, the department works with the agency to arrange for payment and then TenCare issues the payment at the point at which uh, the quarantine period is over or if agencies prefer um, on a weekly basis throughout the duration of the crisis. So that funding is still available today at the point at which we are approaching expiration of that available funding. We will communicate that to the network, um, but, but the funding is available. If you have any questions about that or need to better understand uh, the process and the qualifications, please reach out to your applicable regional office. Uh, they've been processing claims now uh, for about six weeks and certainly are well-versed in the process. Thanks, Kara. Okay, thank you very much. And I apologize, I'm having some uh, technical issues on my end. Um, so uh, we'll work through it the best we can. Um, okay, I see um, uh, a question is, is will the Katie Beckett waiver be part of the IDD integration program? Uh, Jordan, would you like to discuss that? No. Sure, thanks, Kara. So the plan, as indicated, uh, will be to move all waiver-funded HCBS programming underneath the, or running through the managed care operation. And Deputy Commissioner Kidd talked about some of the advantages of that process. Uh, certainly the additional revenue collection uh, is an advantage, but I do wanna point out that, that simply collecting additional revenue is not the catalyst for for the movement that was amount or the the approach that was announced last Friday. The catalyst is to be able to look at services and processes across all service environments, uh, delete redundancies where we can to to be able to increase efficiency for providers. Uh, obviously, the network that will be providing services through the Katie Beckett waiver. Uh, is the same network that is providing services across the ECF and 1915C waiver programs. And so holistically, our intent is, is to try to unify requirements uh, and processes, including we got a few questions last Friday uh, and since that time about billing processes. Certainly, um, any of the places that, that we can look to align um, and increase the efficiency for both the provider network and the department and care organizations are the areas that we're going to target first and to, to derive the additional tax revenue value of running all programming through the managed care operations helps us offset additional reduction costs and future costs uh, that, that we don't know yet. Um, so I, I think as a whole that all HCBS programming will be planned to run through the same vehicle going forward. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, the next question we got was, please explain how the HMO premium tax is paid and who pays the tax. Uh, I'm gonna uh, turn it back over to Deputy Commissioner Andy Kidd. Thanks, Chair, that's a great question. Um, so the MCOs will pay that um, premium tax. 
and that's based on the revenues that flow through their their company. So it's it's the MCOs that actually pay that. All right, great. Thank you very much. I am looking to see um, whether or not we have any other questions in our chat box. I am not seeing any questions, but that doesn't mean they're not there. So I will pause for about 10, 15 seconds, see if we have any more questions. And if not, this will be probably the shortest office hours we've ever had. Oh, that, um, uh, somebody all right, great. Um, so under the concept plan, uh, for the items sought through the waivers, will DIDD make it, be making the decisions? Will the MCOs be making the decisions or 10 care? Uh, Jordan, uh, do you want to kind of talk a little bit about this? I mean, obviously there's a lot that's still in the early stages. Yeah, sure, Kara. So I, I think, not I think, I can directly say that consistent with the way we have participated in program development and system development uh, through the ECF launch, uh, certainly within the 1915C programs, most recently the changes in day services, that our intent will be to gather input from all stakeholders. So that would include families and people supported first and foremost agencies uh, within the network that will be providing the services. Certainly the department and TenCare uh, will be participatory in those discussions and, and then also bringing in the managed care organizations to work as a collective. The, the premise and the approach of unifying systems uh, is, is intended to leverage the value that can be brought to bear by all participating parties. In a perfect world, this system gets developed with, with input from everyone. Um, certainly when you have a collective of organizations and stakeholders and, and state business entities all participating in that discussion, there's, there's the assumption of compromise, but our intent, uh, I think again as a collective, will be to come to the best possible outcome ultimately for people supported. And so, Feedback will be solicited um, as the program is developed and designed both from a system standpoint, uh, from DIDD's perspective as the administrative and oversight body, as well as uh, the network and the managed care organizations. Ultimately, the goal will be to hear what works best for everybody to pick the systems that are the most effective, efficient, and streamlined, and then to put in place a program that ultimately supports people entering the new program in the best way possible. And that, that includes everything from the package of services uh, to the way they, they plan, submit, uh, and receive approval for services, and then ultimately in the way those services are administrated um, from an oversight and regulatory standpoint. And so consistent with the way we've always done it, we'll approach it in the same way uh, here, and we look to get started with that here very shortly. Apologize, like I said, we're having some technical issues uh, issues that day. Um, are there any updates on the DIDD budget? Uh, Commissioner Turner will uh, discuss that. Yeah, thanks, Tara. This will be a fairly short answer, but the answer is no. Uh, we do not have any new updates. Obviously, as soon as we get something that's concrete uh, and permanent, we will let you know, but there is no update. Uh, thank you. Um, do we have a stop date for the non-med training staff administering medications, or can we uh, continue to train staff to give at this time? Uh, either uh, Dr. Davis or Teresa Sloan, would you like to um, answer this question? Uh, there's no change in your ability to conduct uh, medication administration training at this time. Great, thank you very much. Uh, will homebound supports continue past July? Jordan? Yeah, thanks, Kara. So we, we haven't made an official decision relative to the continuation of homebound services. What I would say uh, is consistent with what we've said all along. As we continue to monitor the data, Dr. Davis 
uh, provided a snapshot of the most current data. And, and unfortunately uh, for us in the community abroad, that data is not positive, um, is not trending in a positive direction. And so as we uh, approach closer the expiration deadline, we'll provide communication. Um, first and foremost, the department's priority, the priority of the division at 10 care is certainly to assure that people receiving supports are afforded the opportunity to receive those supports in a safe way while we also are providing them the opportunities for informed decision making relative to when and how they choose to, to engage in community activities. Uh, to that end, the department is in the process right now of finalizing a risk benefit assessment tool that we hope to get out uh, today or tomorrow that will help circles of support and, and those contemplating those decisions uh, kind of define an environment within which those decisions can be made in an informed way. Um, but we, we intend to continue to allow for services to be provided uh, in the safest manner possible as this pandemic just continues to ebb and flow. And so as we've done since March, we'll evaluate that uh, throughout as we get close to any expiration of policy change or availability of service afforded through Appendix K, then we'll communicate that decision. All right, thank you very much, Jordan. Um, uh, will the unified system for reportable events still, still start in October 2020, or will this also start in July 2021? Uh, Teresa Sloan has been, um, and her group have been spearheading that. Uh, I'll let her discuss that. Thanks, Kara. Um, due to COVID and some delays we've experienced with training and, and some other crucial parts of the one system implementation for critical event management, the go live date has been moved from October of 2020 to December of 2020. So that is actually when it will occur. At this point in time, we're, we have no contemplation of holding that um, until the one system goes into effect. Thanks, Kara. All right. Um, so, um, so a question about details on the recommendation that all individuals get tested prior to returning to their home from a family visit. We have had great pushback with this request from families. Um, I will, um, I'll turn this over to Dr. Davis to talk about. Yeah, that may have been a uh, misunderstanding of the recommendation. I think what an agency needs to do is evaluate the risk associated with any particular activity that a person's involved in. Uh, you can set your own policy as it relates to when you would, uh, would want someone to be tested. Uh, that is something that we have given you the fl flexibility to be able to do. Um, you want to make sure that that uh, policy that you have is reasonable under the circumstances and that you're able to get the testing uh, that you're requiring for people to, to have. Um, you know, it, it probably, we're, we're going to be putting out some guidance soon. I, I think uh, Deputy Commissioner Allen is going to be putting out some guidance about a risk assessment that you might do for any particular activity that a person's engaging in and that that might be your guide as to whether or not testing needs to be involved in a person returning to that setting. Um, yeah, you also have to be somewhat practical with respect to how available the testing is because people are often now having to wait some period of time and uh, having difficulty getting tested at health departments. Um, we are making an effort to make testing more widely available, but it is going to, for persons supported, be made based on symptoms and exposures, not on, uh, you know, simple circumstances where they might have been separated from, from their setting. So, um, so that's what we have planned. Uh, we also are working with Department of Health to see if we can identify a program whereby staff will receive testing on a regular basis as well. Uh, that is still in discussion right now. So as soon as we have more definitive information, I'll share that. Thank you, Carol. Okay. Um, oh, have ECF Choices re recipients been notified officially about the integration plan? Jordan, you wanna tackle this one? Uh, sure, thanks, Kara. So a, a meeting has been held with the managed care organizations. It took place uh, last week on Friday and the managed care organizations would then be providing information to the network of providers in the ECF network. 
Um, as far as recipients of service in the ECF Choices Program, um, by proxy, my assumption is that, that folks have been notified. There has not been a specific meeting set with people receiving services in either the 1915 or the ECF program, though information relative to the integration plan certainly has been well distributed across the network. Because the network is mostly a shared network at this point, uh, I feel fairly confident that persons across both program environments are aware. Yes, and, and as the communications person for DIDD, uh, when uh, one of the things that uh, I personally hope to bring uh, with my team is, is once uh, these services are under the direct operational uh, leadership of DIDD to really strategize and formulate plans on how we can make sure that um, we are communicating with the families and the people who are supported through the ECF Choices Program um, and, and hear their input as well um, and, and be able to provide that open level of communication to that program as well. So, um, so I just wanted to um, add that as well. Um, and you're welcome, Janet. Um, let's see, I think that's it for questions for the time being. So I am going to turn it over to Commissioner Connor. Thanks, Karen. Again, thank you to everyone for the questions. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to get in front of you uh, and try to answer the questions that we have answers to. And if we don't have answers, at least do some research and try to be able to provide some context uh, and then provide some answers down the road. Uh, this is a good group of individuals that are passionate about what they do and certainly appreciate your contribution in these meetings because I think they're important. I think communication is key uh, and getting the answers directly from us certainly helps eliminate, uh, at least in my eyes, eliminate any of the confusion uh, about where that answer came from or, or some of the rumors as we've shared in the past. Last thing we wanna do is, is have misinformation out there, miscommunication out there. We wanna to continue to be good partners uh, with you as we relay information that's critical to uh, not only your provider agencies, but uh, to the person supported. So with that, I'll say uh, have a good rest of your day and I appreciate your time and I'll turn it back to Kara. Thanks everyone. All right, and just a few things before we go. First of all, um, we will be shortly posting, a, a, remember with the IDD integration plan, this is not a fully fleshed out plan. We will be, in, we really would like your input and feedback as we start to uh, look at program design and contemplate what this plan might look like. Um, so we will be posting a uh, form staff to be able to gather that. We'll also be having a deeper presentation about this uh, plan as well and what we're looking to do. So be, keep on, keep out for that. I just wanna make sure people realize that there is plenty of opportunity for stakeholder input and we are not, um, we are not looking to, um, to uh, keep stakeholder input out of this process. In fact, it's more important than ever. So please share your thoughts with us. We'll have uh, some more information coming out and we're looking forward to working together on this. Thank you and we will talk to you next week.